Ben Sidrin, this is, I guess, your second annual birthday. Third. Conversation. I don't think we did a podcast two years ago. I think last year we did one, and we're doing one now. Yeah, but this is my third annual 75th birthday. I don't know if you remember, but I declared uh, last year my second annual 75th birthday, so this would be my third annual 75th birthday. How long do you plan I'm to keep this, this up? I'm going out this way. I'm going out this way. I'm celebrating 75. I like 75. It's a nice couple of numbers. It's a good-looking pair of numbers. It goes up high, and it's not as high as, you know, you're not going to fall off the top. Mm-hmm. I would like to say <laughs> that I have something in mind that I want to ask you, but the fact is all bets are off this year. You know, we have, over the years, kind of parsed the, the zeitgeist the zeitgeist, and tried to make sense of the present in the context of the history, tried to make sense of the history totally in the context screwed. of totally the present. Totally screwed. Totally screwed. We are currently, as the title went, slouching toward Bethlehem. Uh, we know not where we're headed. We are out in unchartered waters. We have never had this combination of elements. I mean, forget the pandemic. I mean, of course, that's huge. But the pandemic with Trump and the pandemic with Trump and Black Lives Matter and the pandemic and Trump and the economy and sinking and the Black Lives Matter and all these things coming together is just amazing. This is amazing. When we last spoke, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. We had a phone conversation because we were not in the same physical place as we are right now. Mm. And you had gone through a kind of dark space when this whole thing started. Particularly, yeah. you were sad for your granddaughter. You felt that you were sad uh-huh. that she would have to live through this, that this was her world that she was coming into. But then you kind of opened up into a very optimistic and calm space. Rallied. Well, that's interesting because of the five of us uh, currently uh, sheltered in place in uh, uh, Madison. She's the coolest. She's the one who's grooving hardest, has the fewest problems with the situation. Mm-hmm. So clearly I was feeling bad for myself, not for her, because she's a resilient uh, person at her age. But I think I was feeling bad for me that I, I couldn't control what was coming for my people. And it was a feeling of powerlessness, I think. I'm glad you bring that up because I think that that's one of the teachings of this experience mm-hmm. that you know, you live now 77 years, you try to live a responsible life, you try to do good work, you do good work, and you make a contribution. And already, I think you have been feeling a certain indignity that the contribution that you made may become... (laughs) It was historical, and we may have witnessed the end of history, right? which may trivialize 50 years of work. Well, there's that concern, because you've devoted so much of your life to documenting the world around you. You often have said that you see your career essentially in terms of being a journalist. Yep. So when the world stops understanding why that's important, well, as, it's a bit uh, disheartening. As, as Mose Allison said, there's always a Mose Allison quote for pretty much anything in the modern world. He said, well, ever since the world ended, I don't get out as much. And I think that that's true for my work now, my work. (laughs) Although, who knows? In a way, that is the ultimate takeaway here. Nobody knows. The scientists don't know. The politicians don't. Nobody knows anything now. This is really all hands on deck. And at the same time, mortality has never been closer to the front door, Mm. right? Everybody in the back of their mind now has a little knock on the door, and it could be them or it could be someone they know or someone Mm. they love. And I think when you're in a time when mortality is your partner, as the 60s were and various other times were, they become remarkable, memorable times. Mm. And I'm sure it's only in deep retrospect that you can get any sense of the importance of them. So that's an optimistic way of saying, well, I look forward to living another 10 years, 15 years to see how this plays out. This is not the end of the world, you know. Is it a fortune cookie or a Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times? Yes, that's the curse. I thought it was a Chinese curse. That's the curse. And here we are. But looking back, we also find that that's a time of intense creativity. 
Is this a time of intense creativity? Yeah, but what we're working on is ourselves, not some art project. I mean, I think everybody is being very creative in terms of exploring what their options are, uh, what's important, what you're willing to give up, what you have discovered about yourself that may be more important than the other things you believed in. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very creative. Yes. But... For the performance arts, no, this is this is doomsday. <laughs> I mean, it'll come back in some other way. And maybe, you know, we were watching uh, Live at Smalls yesterday, George Cables and Eric Alexander, and they were burning. And you said, and it was really profound, the fact that it's live happening right now really makes it important. And it did. It wasn't just a video of some cats playing somewhere. It was now. Yeah. Somewhere on this planet, cats are doing this. I was very moved watching it with you yesterday. You yeah. know, I, I tune in every now and then when I'm at my computer, I get the little notification that Smalls Live is happening and I tune in and I see what's happening. But watching it with you, because, you know, because we're generally in isolation, so I haven't had anybody to watch it with. Yeah. And yeah. to be in the room with you, it was interesting. As we know, Music, when it's experienced by more than one person at the same time... Sounds different. Sounds different. It's different. And just listening to it with you yesterday in the same room was a feeling that I haven't had in a long time. Also knowing that it, it was happening live on Earth right now. Now, there's another thing that I felt, though, that these guys might as well be at the end of the Earth. I mean, they're in this cave, mm -hmm. in empty... I saw that too. Smalls. I felt that. Yeah. In the basement in Manhattan, this uh, functional jazz space. Yes. Nothing glitz or decorative about it. It's there for the presentation of the cats and yes. the music. Ground zero for jazz. It's very impressive, man. It's like the Warsaw Ghetto or something, man. I mean, this is it. It, it reminds me of, is it in 1984 where they are all gathered in the woods reading books? Fahrenheit 451. In Fahrenheit 451, at the end of it, they're out in the woods reading books. But imagine that there were a live stream of them reading books. That was what the experience was like. That is one of the most powerful images ever. The idea that the society burned books, burned knowledge. The idea was the elders, each one would pick a book to embody and read it to uh, the younger person, the next generation. So the book would live on. The people didn't live on, but the book lived on. And yeah, watching the hang at Smalls, we don't know what this situation is going to do to performing arts, top to bottom, dance, music, theater. Yeah. There's no way to know, but we know one thing. It's never going to be the casual, just how much is the ticket kind of hang anymore. People are really going to prize this and want it, or people aren't going to bother. They're going to be watching some poodle bark in the backyard. We've got to close the window, man. I'm sorry. I can't work like this. I got over a hundred people listening to this. You know, something else is interesting, aside from just the mechanics of physical space and social distance and mass and all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, we were approached to go back to Paris this November and play. The club was open. Did we want to go? And aside from whether we want to get on a plane or any of that stuff, my first thought was, I don't think I could play at this time, I don't think I would know what I'm doing getting in front of those people and presenting it because I'm used to presenting it in a different world and to different people. The people in this world are no longer those people. Mm. Everybody has been totally traumatized from here till Tuesday, as I was saying, with the COVID and the, and the Trump and all this stuff. How do you get in front and entertain, create, provide some sort of solace? How do you even do that? Better a comic. I could see a comic wanting to but go But see, there. what I would say is, no, it is you. You know, as a matter of fact, with every argument that you make about why you are not the guy to do it, I'm further convinced that the world needs you more now than ever. And I'm reminded of that moment when we were in Paris during the terrorist attacks in November of 2015, I think it was, that the Bataclan was attacked. And we were not far from there. And Nobody knew what to do. And they looked at you because you were the guy on stage <laughs> for answers. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And that is ultimately the modern view of the troubadour. The troubadour used to just show up and give you the news. The modern view is the troubadour shows up 
and gives you the news in some sort of context or perspective. It's postmodern troubadouring. Or you used the word shaman the other day, which I found interesting because it's kind of a little further left than the African storyteller uh-huh. who comes, which is, you know, a little more earthy than a troubadour. A troubadour, you know, was singing madrigals in a clown suit. But basically, you're right. There is a need for it and a place for it, which supposes that this entire model that we've been using and seeing of show business and record business and radio and boom, that's totally obsolete. Now, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to dig deep, go underground, show up at venues that didn't exist. Well, what we have learned is that community and connection happens on a lot of levels. And I know that there are those among us who are gathering in large motorcycle oh, yeah, in South you Dakota. Know, rallies and that there are some people in the country who are thinking that there's only one way to gather and connect. But there are a lot of us out here who have turned to the technology in order to figure out how to gather, that feeling connected and feeling uh, a sense of community can I'm, happen in a lot of ways. I'm very impressed. I have to say this. I, I was very cynical. I'm of the age where we don't trust technology. We can't do technology. We're not good at it. Yeah. And uh, recently, a couple of events, uh, not least watching Smalls, yeah. but also watching uh, this uh, Seder that was yeah. put on in April, the yep. Saturday Night Seder, which was spectacular in, in the way it delivered the Yiddishkeit, the actual taste of the food and the, and the ironic humor. I mean, it had the texture. It really did. And you were present at a social event. There was no question about it. Yeah. And... I didn't think it was any less textural than being at a Seder with a bunch of people. I was very impressed that technology can do that if it's thought out properly. I mean, to some extent, I wonder if that's going to be the change. Like, you say, okay, well, in order to really be the shaman, you know, you'd have to go underground, you'd have to find ways to gather people in small rooms, and that is an increasingly old-style way of thinking. It's practically medieval, isn't it? <laughs> that, I mean, I thought when we watched Eric Alexander and Joe Farnsworth playing at Smalls yesterday on Smalls Live, I thought, this is like medieval. I mean, it's incredible huh. that the, the level is so high, and these cats are practitioners of this music, that they're keeping it alive. And Alchemists. Alchemists, and that they care. Yes. It, it actually, it's feeling more real to me, I think, wow, this is unbelievable that these people are out here caring this much about the music on this level, when the fact is, most of the world doesn't even know what it is. Couldn't be bothered. You're absolutely right. You know, it's always been, except for a a blip for 20 years or 30 years in, in the heyday of the record companies, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever it is, is the jazz has always been 2% of 2%. I mean, it's a very, very small number. And it certainly has had plenty of exposure. It's not for lack of exposure. It's difficult music. And it's personal music. And the people who come to it come to it generally young and for personal reasons. And by the time, you know, they're hanging with their pals, they're sophisticated, they're trading. It's like they could be I don't want to say chess players, but the, but they're engaged in something that's very abstract and very emotional mm-hmm. at the same time. And then, of course, the whole education thing spun off of it and gave it another level of, of being. But basically, jazz is an inside thing. And we've always thought that was the good news, man. I mean, you didn't want a lot of people there who really didn't appreciate it, who, who was shouting out, yeah, man, after the drum <laughs> solo. you know, Groovy, baby. <laughs> you didn't necessarily need that. It's interesting because on the one hand, we're talking about how, although there was this heyday of the record business, I am reminded that this year, you know, you put out this book, Mm. a biography of the late, great Tommy LaPuma, who embodies that period that you're talking about. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. That was the reality of the business for for some time. And Tommy was in the business for real. There's just no question about it. The way he approached it, he just wasn't a numbers guy. He was in the room where it happened, you know? Right, literally. I mean, Tommy was a producer who liked to be in the... He was a jazz record producer, the most commercially successful jazz record producer who ever was. You wrote this book 
about Tommy. You know, when Tommy passed away, I remember you and I were together and we kind of processed his loss and, and talked about him. And, and a lot of the stories that you told then were uh, the source material that turned mm-hmm. into the book. Mm-hmm. What we didn't know then is how it would be received. And what's so interesting is that the reception of the book and all of the reviews are focused on the idea that Tommy's life as presented in the book, you use it as a way of telling the story about the business and the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And what better year to think about what was and how it's changed than this one. Yeah, and, and, and what a personal education for me to see that what I was always considering would probably be obscure to most people, the fact that this isn't just an interesting story of an interesting guy, but it's a story about a world and a life that's passed with him, coincidentally. And uh, a lot of po- uh, a lot of people got that and felt that and saw that, and I think it's teaching me something about uh, simplicity of narrative, the cleanliness of storytelling that a well-told story, clean, no filigree, is what we need now. (laughs) We don't need a lot of rhetoric. We need the simple storytelling about the human situation. And that's what Tommy's book was. And people immediately sat down and read it. People, I can't tell you how many people wrote and said, I read it. Uh, I started at noon and at 6.30 I was done. Yeah. Because it's not huge, it's not a tome, it doesn't have footnotes, it's a story. I think the idea of simplicity, discovering who you are, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche to say it comes with age, but you get tired of all the dancing that you do when you're younger. Paul Simon has a great line in One Trick Pony. Well, I think One Trick Pony is a, is a song about Steve Gadd, by the way because it's about a horse that dances so beautifully and so effortlessly. But I remember uh, when you interviewed Paul Simon years ago, he described Steve Gadd as being like a, like a dancer. Did he? But he says about the one-trick pony, he says he, he moves so smoothly, his hooves are so smoothly and elegant, without all this herky-jerky motion that I have to make. And I thought, well, that's really beautiful. I mean, that's the essence of what we're trying to do out here, you know? Simple, elegant, human, touch the heart, move on. Well, I felt that way watching Joe Farnsworth play drums yesterday. I yeah. thought, you see cats whose bodies yeah. over time yeah. are most comfortable in the position when they're playing. I mean, you see people when they assume jazz position. Uh, absolutely. Where George the, Cables, too, the way George, he sat at the piano. Yes. The way he sat there, you could tell how he's going to play. Well, Farnsworth as well, and, absolutely. And this is, you know, what, uh, I don't know who said it to you, Miles or John Hendricks said, the way you hold a baby can swing. Yeah, John said, everything you do can swing. Yeah, the way you hold a baby. Miles said, you can tell everything about the way I play by the way I stand. He actually just said it. Um, so to have a grammar like music or any art form is a big advantage because you have a grammar that doesn't have to be literally parsed by what other people hmm. think, you know. But at the same time, the pressure against the performing arts is extraordinary right, right. So, And so to speak this language at this moment is a very strange time to be speaking the language. Now, look, we may look back at this even five years from now and say, remember that blip on the radar? Yeah, remember that right. nine that months wasn't nothing. Yeah, we thought yeah. that. It's, it's like the Y2K thing, right? The world's totally. going to crash. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And it may not. I mean, the world may not crash, you know. But there is a feeling of transition here. Now, I want to focus on another example of the simplicity that comes with maturity. Okay. Because in honor of your 77th birthday, oh, yes. okay. we are also releasing a new song. We new got song. together last week in the studio in Madison, masks on, went into the studio, DNA in Madison, and recorded a new song for you. Mm-hmm. Who's the old guy now? Who's the old guy now? It's a wonderful, simple uh, sentiment, arrangement. But when I was explaining the, the beat to the recording engineer, uh, the, the feel that I wanted my drummer, Leo, to play, I said, well, it's Hayfoot Strawfoot. He said, what's Hayfoot Strawfoot? 
I said, well, hayfoot, strawfoot is what they used to say to army recruits who came out of some totally rural situation and didn't know their left from the right. So your left foot was your hayfoot and your right foot was your strawfoot. And it's just a basic way to walk through the furrows out in the fields. And actually, I have to say, the first verse which you wrote really sets it up beautifully. When I was a young man Just getting started I didn't even have me a ride in the town. I asked my heroes out on the corner. I said, now, brother, where'd you get that sound? And that's what it's about. It's like, as you get older, it's not about the notes, it's about the sound, it's about the space. It's, the song literally describes what it is to get older and play older. I wanted to suggest that verse for you because I realized that that is what you did. I mean, when you were a young man, you might not have felt like a young man at the time, I don't know, but when you were in your 30s and your 40s, you devoted much of your life and career to talking to your heroes. And they might have only been 10 years older than you, but they must have seemed like they were wise beyond their years. And you went and you got them and you documented the conversations. And really what you asked all of them mm -hmm. was, where does your sound come from? You're absolutely right. You know, I never realized that. Is that right? Yeah. I never realized that's what that verse referred to. That verse is you huh. as a young man asking the jazz elders, where do you find your sound? Right. And now... And, and one by one they told me. And uh, what they told you is, uh, you got to go out there and get it. You know, you got to go find it. <laughs> There's a, they told you, you got to fail. You got to recover from failure. You have to recover from failure. We don't learn from success. We only learn from failure. Success teaches you nothing. When they say in learning in general, you can't learn anything unless you're surprised by it. If you think you already know it, you can't learn it. And you may not know it, but if you think you know it hmm. and it comes by you, you won't learn it. It's only if, you're, if there's an element of surprise, which is why when they call jazz the sound of surprise, it's really powerful because that's true. Jazz is about in the recovery. When you mm -hmm. screw up, yeah. when you play a note you didn't intend, how do you see a simple story in a mistake? Mm-hmm. So simplicity, once again, shines its yeah. bright face at us. It's a goal. Because I want to talk also about the other project that you've been kind of focused on this year. You know, we talked about your Tommy LaPuma book, which yeah. came out this year. Yeah. Oddly, I think that it was well-timed, the LaPuma book. You know? I, I totally agree. I don't know what you mean. Maybe it was timed exactly in that moment when we felt the world changing. And Tommy's story represents what the world was. And it's compelling and amazing and interesting. I mean, it also speaks to the power of human conviction. And, you know, he wanted it so badly. So bad, yeah. Built himself up from nothing. And he had talent, but he had desire. And he, and he had passion. And he had empathy. And to read that story in today's uh, climate, maybe it, it resonates even more deeply. The other thing, however, that you have been very focused on doing this year is revisiting your book, Jews, Music, and the American Dream, that yeah. came out nine years ago. Yeah. You had a new foreword written by my former podcast guest, Howard S. Becker, and uh, you wrote a new epilogue. Yes. And let's be honest, you struggled. Struggled. <laughs> oh, it, was, it was so hard. The book, when it came out 10 mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. really looked at although it goes back thousands of years, yeah. it really looks at the 20th century. 20th century. In America. In America, and it really kind of comes to an end in the year 2000. And just give me a sense of what you would say is that arc. People coming from nothing, much as I suppose Tommy came from nothing, coming with deep traditions, a soulful connection to uh, language and music and humor, and finding an opportunity both in the technology and in the marketplace to become key developers and presenters of something that turned into popular music. And popular music really didn't exist before the 20th century. It wasn't popular. Well, I mean, there was like folk ballads. We talked about troubadours. But, but it was nothing like music about average people. Music was always about kings and queens and popes. and stuff. Or it was folk. Or it was folk. Or it was folk. And so this was different. This was 
let's face it, middle-class music because there hadn't been a middle class before America, really. So that arc through the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and the way Jews, for various reasons, shaped it and shaped the experience and how, toward the end of the 20th century, it was being devastated by greed and marketing and technology and the cheap buck and, uh, frankly, the hyper-corporatization of all the arts. You know, the five big record companies, one was owned by a waste management concern, one was owned, I mean, it was just became ludicrous compared to what it had been 20 or 30 years before. So here's this arc that had a beginning and middle and end. And then my problem was, yeah, and then what? Now what do you say? I mean, you basically set it up. And the conceit in the book is based on the, the title is There Was a Fire, and it's a, a story about a famous rabbi who saves... The Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, who saves his community by knowing how to build a special fire in a special place and say a special prayer in a particular forest. And generation after generation, these things get lost until the very end. Nobody knows how to build a fire, say the prayer, where in the forest. Eh? But they say maybe just the memory that there was a fire will be enough and the people will be saved. And it was. And that's the story. That's the myth. And so I, I closed the book off uh, when it was finished 10 years ago by saying, so same with popular music in America and the Jewish impact. Maybe just the memory that there was of music that spoke of a higher cause, whether it was uh, Yip Harburg and Brother Can You Spare a Dime or... Bob Dylan, Blown in the Wind, whatever it was. And that music talked about intimacy and real human life. Simplicity again, sim simple life. Right, because one of your conceits is that there is social justice yeah. in songs about love and relationships. Right. Yeah, the idea is that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And the antidote to indifference is caring, is to care about something, someone, and that in the act of caring, just a boy and a girl, you begin to heal the indifference in the world. And uh, that's very powerful. And there's a whole Jewish aspect that's laid out in the book to that end. But there I was four or five months ago looking at the last 10 years, actually looking at the last 20 years, really. Because your thinking is it's we're going to put out a second edition of the book. It's been 10 years. Let's what update I, the thinking. Let's update the thinking. And the first thing that occurred to me is, well, as, as this conversation started, we are in a dramatically different place than we were 20 years ago. I mean, that was even, that was George W. days, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, was, it was before Obama and that whole sense of rising hope and then the collapse of who we are due to Trump. Uh, the more you look at it, the, the more astonishing it really is. I mean, Trump was a meteor from outer space who destroyed Earth mm. in, in many ways. Or, you know, he was like Godzilla, this guy in a r big rubber suit stomping on, on all the power plants or something. <laughs> so there's Trump, and then there's COVID as we started, and all this stuff. And so where's Jewish music in this? Where are the Jews in this? Is it that there really isn't a Jewish story in America anymore? Is that something that we have to confront? Is it that it's not a Jewish business anymore because it's not a business anymore? Spotify doesn't say they're in the music business. They say they're in the subscription business. So maybe there's not a music business per se, whether it's Jewish or not. There are all these different ways into looking at that. Or when we looked at the Black Lives Matter protests, I realized no music came out of it. Mm -hmm. And that was startling because John Lewis had just passed away, and John Lewis was the guy who said music was the key to the protest movements, that music was the way solidarity was formed. Mm -hmm. And the only art that came out of Black Lives Matter were primarily, so far, has been decorations on face masks. Public murals. And, and that public murals. Yeah. But well, that we didn't turn to music, that a nation doesn't turn to music to unify itself, to heal itself the way it once did the way it once did for a, a period in the 20th century. I don't think that was necessarily the case. Maybe the 18th century, you could go back and see starts of it with military stuff yes. or whatever. But no, we had, it, the 20th century was such an aberration. It, it, it's such a beautifully cultural-driven aberration for, for the best and the worst. I mean, yes. it was a brutal, 
brutal hundred years and at the same time an enormous flowering of human potential. Do you think that the Jews have gotten too comfortable in America and that's part of the reason the story is harder to find, to tease out? I would phrase it differently. I would say that America (laughs) was looking for the Jews just like the Jews were looking for America. And there's a synergy there and that although there's still plenty of anti-Semitism to go around, when I was uh, 13 years old, man, the, the Holocaust was terrifying. The Holocaust was this nightmare that you would literally wake up from sometimes mm-hmm. with a nightmare. And now the statistics are the majority of millennials have never heard of Auschwitz or the Holocaust. And when I was talking to Steve Nadler here, mm-hmm. who's in the Jewish Studies program, he said that is true. And it's one of the reasons Jewish Studies programs are flourishing around the country, because rather than getting the information from your elders or some uh, some guy who survived the shtetls and is teaching yes. Hebrew to you, uh. those, all those guys, are, everybody's died. Yes. The only place to get Jewish history now is in, in college. And isn't that a lot like the only place to get jazz? It's, it's the first thought I had when you said that. You know, you're looking for first degree sources, right? Primary sources. And it's not that they're not here. I mean, I was just thinking... I was driving the car today, and they played a track with Roy Haynes playing with John Coltrane. Mm. And I thought, well, Roy Haynes is still walking among us. Mm -hmm. So all of the people that have played with Roy Mm -hmm. have really been one degree away from Bird and one degree away from the birth of Bebop. And as long as you can still touch that spark, you know what I mean? You can still feel that first fire, that first flame. You're still in touch with the... But as soon as that starts to go... It's not that only those guys had the real information and everything that came after isn't the real thing, but it is interesting that it was, it was very connected. And, you know, lately on, even on Facebook, I've been seeing photos of Miles and Louis Armstrong sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, these Mm -hmm. great photos of people who are, you know, in the world together, in the business together, even though they were making very different kinds of music. And you have to realize how much smaller the business and the world were back then. You know, now the business in the world is billions of people. Back then it was hundreds of thousands of people interested in particular kind. I mean, a big hit record, you you didn't sell a million records. You sold hundreds of thousands if you were lucky. But you could still write a song that everybody would know. That everybody would know. Alexander's Ragtime Band. The amazing thing about this Irving Berlin hit in 1912 or whatever it was, (laughs) was it went around the world president whoever it was yeah. landed in ecuador yeah. the band played alexander's ragtime band it was america the national anthem wasn't uh, voted in as the national anthem till the 30s you know that's interesting because i remember when i was in eighth grade and i had to do a project on how a bill becomes a law oh yeah you and i you know you helped me put it together and we were brainstorming well what what should the bill be that we want to turn into a law and you said do you remember what you said what if we explored w- what it would mean to change the national anthem from the star spangled banner to america the beautiful cuz it's so beautiful yeah the, you're right. you know the one that ray charles sang yes 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 of course and i did my project on how you could change it which even at the time seemed like i mean you know we all got to get passed through Congress right, and blah, right, blah, blah, right. blah. Yeah, but it seemed like it was still such a far off concept. Yeah. The idea that less than 100 years ago, we didn't have a national anthem. 100 years ago, uh, 80 years ago, yeah. Yeah, we didn't have a national anthem. So just to, to, to wrap that up, what conclusion did you reach in your epilogue 10 years later in There Was a Fire? Well, the conclusion was this, that we're on the beginning of the next chapter as well as the end of the last chapter. And what's coming, we can't predict. We can only see movements of how it's affecting the culture around us. We really can't see what it is. We know it's related to technology in some ways. We know it's related to social progress in some ways. We know it's related to the money culture. I mean, we can see various iconic things that are in motion right now, and the pandemic is injecting seriousness into some parts of it. But we don't really know what's motivating it. And I came upon this image, a metaphor of the wind and the trees, that when you look at the trees, you can see they're moving. 
And you can actually write down, if you wanted to, how they're moving and what the impact of their movements might be. Maybe they'll fall out and, and hit a car or whatever. But what you can't see is the wind. You can't see what's moving it. The wind is only obvious in the movement of the trees. And my conclusion was, uh, and our story, our narrative, the Jewish idea of social justice, and that narrative, which was transported, translated through popular culture, through music, so through so many things, is the wind in the trees. Our story is the wind in the trees. And, and we can't parse it the way we used to anymore. But we'll see its effects. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so in the last year, from 76 to 77... You published your book about Tommy LaPuma. Yes. You wrote your final chapter and uh, revisited your book from 10 years ago, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream. Yes. Revisited your thinking about the Jewish contribution to American popular culture in the last 20 years. Yes. You released on your birthday, Who's the Old Guy Now? Oh, well, yes. And, uh, oh, I don't know, three or four other songs over We the recorded year. a few other songs. As a matter of fact, that's right. When Oh, we put out We the People last year. Now we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and security, the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Because we the people, we the people, we are the people, we the people, it ain't no lie if it's true. You did a bit of touring. Played about 30, 40 gigs last year. You have been a creature of a certain kind of habit. You know, you've toured every year consistently mm. in Europe a couple times a year in November and often in the spring. You do a Midwest run in summer and you go and play New York and you play in California and you play, you know, your handful of kind of one-off dates. None of that's happening now. None of it's happening. It's all on pause. Do you think you will want to put that back together when the dust settles? Sometimes I think, well, it's timed out perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> My plan worked. I don't know. You know, I've really enjoyed playing the gigs, first of all, with you and, and, and all these great players we found around the world. It's a lot of fun. And we travel with family and we have great food and great times. I absolutely think we'll continue to do that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, write another book? Well, see, I would have said absolutely not a week ago, but then you uh, suggested something that really in intrigues me. So maybe, maybe there's another book. But I do have the luxury right now of so much work behind me that I'm not anxious about not getting my work done. You know, mm. I, I, well, there was one point in my life where I was just troubled every morning I'd wake up and I had so much to do. Well, and you're was, seeing me go through that. This and week. that's, yes. And, and it was at your age too. In, in starting in, in my early forties, I became very aware that time was ticking and I had all this work to do. It's very frustrating. You go a couple a day or two and you're not not, didn't make any progress. It's like, ah! Yeah, because it comes down to, well, if I don't do it, who will? And if not now, when? And I mean, you get all these things. There is a luxury in being able to, if not get rid of that, at least be too physically <laughs> exhausted to deal with it. <laughs> so. Well, what that's so interesting, though, is that the motivation may change, but the work remains in the sense that at the time, you know, you said to me my whole life, you know, focus on your work. Your work won't let you down. Your work is always there for you. Your work, you know, as I said to you the other day, I worry about too much of that kind of thinking because what happens when you no longer know why you're doing your work? But interestingly, you've made a contribution already. Now you get to do work because it's fun to do. Work. Well, it turns out all the work was fun. Didn't yes. You? Doing the work was always fun. Yes. If I had a failing, my failing was I had no patience at all for the business yeah. and, and the hustle and stuff. It, it just, it, it wasn't that I didn't like it or I didn't respect it. It just bored me to tears. It was, there was no fun in it. There was no pleasure in it. It was all this uh, ridiculous uh, scheming, right? That's what business tends to be, just schemes. Schemes in a casino. I'm reading 
more than I've ever read before. Yeah. I'm exercising more than I've ever exercised before. I'm going out the way most older guys go out, I think. I think this is typical, particularly in some societies where, you know, you get to be sneaking up on 80 and it's assumed you're going to a quieter, more spiritual ah. uh, phase. I mean, that's the assumption. And I, I, I think that's true. Interesting. Yeah, well, also, and that you get to see, I mean, I see you watching me go through my stuff with my daughter or whatever, and you're there, you're very present and engaged, but you're also just watching it, you know, you just get to watch it. Well, because what you learn is uh, there's, there's, there's no uh, right answers, there's only wrong answers. All answers are wrong one way or the other. Mm. All answers are, you know, flawed in some sense. So don't worry. Do it from love. Do it, if you can, after taking three deep breaths. Mm. And don't worry. Worry less. Okay, 77. Who's the old guy now? I am. Ben Sidron, I'll talk to you in a year. I'll see you in Who's 78. Who's the old All right. guy now? Who's the old guy now? <laughs>